I still get to say good morning, everyone, for a few more minutes. Um, as Glenn said, my name is Robert Greenwald. It's really a pleasure to be here today to be moderating this panel discussion on the achievability of universal health care. According to a Kaiser Family Foundation poll released last week, an objective the majority of Americans want met, but that we and our elected decision makers may not be able to align on when it comes to the details. In fact, there are several competing paths forward towards universal coverage. Among them, Medicare for All has certainly been garnering a lot of attention. It calls for universal coverage with a single payer covering all citizens and without allowing for private health insurance. Another path forward calls for universal government-operated system that would allow people to opt out and buy private or supplemental health insurance. There's also a plan that calls for a public option, a form of government insurance offered to all citizens, but that allows people with private coverage to remain with their form of health insurance. And this is an option that would certainly allow us to build off our current system, including the reforms implemented under the Affordable Care Act. And then there are also plans that call for reducing the role of government in health care, getting to universal coverage through subsidies that would make private health insurance more affordable and accessible. So on this panel today, we're going to consider the potential paths forward for reforming our health care system with a focus on the leading questions. Is universal health care coverage achievable in the United States? And if so, is now the time to make it happen? And with which path forward? So joining us today to lead this conversation are two thought leaders in the healthcare space, John McDonough and Joe Antos. And so let me briefly introduce you to them. Um, John McDonough is a professor of public health practice in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Director of Executive and Continuing Professional Education. Among other accomplishments between 2008 and 2010, Professor McDonough served as a senior advisor on national health reform to the United States Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, where he worked on the development and passage of the Affordable Care Act. Between 2003 and 2008, he served as executive director of Health Care for All, a leading consumer health advocacy group here in Massachusetts, where he played a key role in passage and implementation of the 2006 Massachusetts healthcare reform law. Joe Antos, Dr. Antos, is a Wilson H. Taylor Scholar in healthcare and retirement policy at the American Enterprise Institute, where his work focuses on the economics of health policy, including Medicare, single-payer health insurance, the uninsured, the Affordable Care Act, and overall reform of the healthcare system. Dr. Antos is concurrently an adjunct associate professor of emergency medicine at George Washington University. Before joining the institute, Dr. Antos was assistant director of health and human services at the Congressional Budget Office. He later served as health advisor to the Congressional Budget Office from 2007 to 2013. So clearly we have the right people to lead this discussion and I'm going to now turn it over to Professor McDonough. Thanks, Robert. Uh, pleasure to be here with, uh, with Robert, with my friend Joe, and with all of you. I think I've been here before. You have been here before. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I just kind of like to cut to the chase. Um, so can we get to universal health insurance in the United States? Yes. Um, it's, it's not that hard. <laughs> uh, there are many, many ways to do it. Um, and then the parallel question is, can we, could we achieve a Medicare for all style single payer? Uh, and my belief, at least in the short to medium term, is uh, absolutely no. That would not be the way to do it. Um, so that's just the bottom line headline. I have a few slides to share with you that I thought might be helpful in terms of just understanding my thought process in terms of how I get there. Is this on? Do you know? Yes, but we'll get it off. Oh, OK. That would be helpful. Thanks. <laughs> um, <coughs> while we're doing that, so universal health care. Lots of, lots of countries have done it. Just about every country, every advanced country, has some kind of universal health care system. Um, and there are many, many ways to do it. Many people think that the choices between Canada 
and the United States. And there are so many more choices than that, particularly thinking about Germany, Netherlands, Switzerland, UK, France, all, all of those countries that have it pretty settled and, uh, and well down. Um, uh, in the United States right now, of course, we're at about 90% coverage. I think we're up to about over 30 million uninsured, which is an increase over the past several years. Um, importantly, more than half of those uninsured in the United States right now are today eligible for Medicaid, for uh, insurance subsidies under the Affordable Care Act through the health insurance exchanges, uh, and also uh, about 4 million are eligible for employer-sponsored insurance and choose not to take the offer of coverage. So we already have a significant opportunities on there if we were willing to, uh, to make some adjustments. But let me get to my slides I want to share you. I tried to, I, I decided I'd take up the challenge of trying to put 70 years of history in the United States of attempting to achieve some kind of universal coverage or to move significantly forward to it on one single slide. And so that's what I came up with. <laughs> so let me just explain this to you um, pretty, uh, I hope, straightforwardly. So we have, uh, we have on the left the column of presidents who made a major effort going into working with the Congress to try to either achieve universal coverage or to move forward to it. Uh, that doesn't include Ronald Reagan, and we, can have a, we could have a robust conversation about that, yeah, that. Um, uh, because I don't, I, you know, he did some important health reforms, including the prospective payment system in Medicare in 1983 and the catastrophic coverage Act of 1988, which came to a catastrophic end I'm, in 1989. I'm, I'm particularly sensitive about that one. <laughs> um, or George W. Bush, who created Medicare Part D, the prescription drug part of Medicare, because I view those as sort of advances in terms of benefits and what's covered, as opposed to kind of bringing a new group in in terms of some security of coverage. So these are the presidents. And by the way, I put this up here uh, to kind of invite you to take me on and tell me what I got totally wrong about this. But so these, this is my list of the president. It starts with Harry Truman. I don't think it goes beyond that. People mention Teddy Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt. but he was only the king. He was running for president yeah. with the Bull Moose Party. He wasn't, he never attempted to do it when he was president. He never worked with Congress. FDR thought about it, laid it aside. Truman right. took up his thing. So anyway, so that's it. The next column is the year of the win or the loss, ultimately, the ultimate disposition of it, where it ended, what year, success or failure. Then the next column is which party controlled the White House in the year of decision. And I think you can probably see a trend there. And then the next column is which parties controlled the Senate and the House on the year of decision. And then the next column, and we could get into some conversation about this, what was the policy ambition? Was the policy ambition comprehensive, to try to go essentially the whole way, or was it to try to go a significant distance, but even recognizing that it was really essentially incremental? So you know, one could argue that 1965 Lyndon Johnson was probably the high watermark of advancing health reform. You could get into a nice parlor argument about which was more important, LBJ 65 or Obama in 2010. But they're both pretty substantial. And interestingly, the two high water marks of health reform are both, I think, recognized as incremental. Uh, Truman tried to go the whole way, failed utterly. <coughs> uh, his advisors thought, well, we went too far. We're going to have to take it piece by piece. And it was really in the early 1950s that people started talking about, let's try to cover all senior citizens. 15 years later, it happened. Under, uh, under President Johnson. And then, of course, the final column is, was it a win or a loss? So if you just take a look at those last two columns over on the right, I think you can see a trend. I don't, I don't think it's that hard, actually, to see that. And this is not, this doesn't predict the future, um, but I think it gives some perspective in terms of what 
the temperament of the United States is when it comes to advancing <coughs> toward universal coverage and what fits and what falls flat on its face. And the three times that it fell flat on its face were the three times when there was an attempt at serious advances toward universal coverage, including, most people forget this, surprise, surprise, 1974 under President Richard Nixon actually produced probably one of the smartest efforts at universal coverage, actually, if you look at the history of it. So that's the, that's the, that's the first slide, and I invite your criticism of this. Um, but just to understand uh, it, that uh, there's, there, there is a pattern here in terms of what we've seen, and we can ignore the past, or we can at least kind of pay attention to it and try to discern the learning. And that's one of the things, if, I, if I'm to fault the Medicare for all single payer movement in the United States, it always seems when it reaches that point where it's catching a wave that it absolutely doesn't want to look back and learn from history. I view it kind of a little bit as an ahistorical movement that it's always kind of like the idea was like just born and let's do it. There's a lot of history here that's really important. Now we look at the two most recent ones, Barack Obama and uh, Bill Clinton, not 97 chip, but 93, 94. And interesting, so the two in say in this generation or this generation and the last generation. If, if you're old enough. If you're old <laughs> enough. <laughs> um, interesting, both of those efforts happened and you notice they happened with Democrats in control of the House and the Senate. Both times the loss in 94 and the win in 2010. And of course interesting, those were the two those were the periods, the terms of office, when Democrats had unified control of the House and the Senate and the White House at the same time. And so interesting parlor question. Um, thinking of, say, the modern era, and I, I will date the modern era starting in 1981 with Ronald Reagan. And I think we are living still in the Reagan, neoliberal, whatever label you want to put on it, era. So interesting question, and so it's so, and, and we know what it's gonna look like in 2020 uh, in terms of which party controls those three power sources or power centers. So question, how many years in that 40 year period did Democrats control the House, the Senate, and the White House? I don't hear people guess about that very much, but it's interesting. So I happen to have looked it up, and here it is. Four years, Democrats controlled all three for four years, 93, 94, and 2009 and 10. Republicans, by contrast, controlled it for about six and a third years. That was that weird year in <laughs> weird. 2001 when the guy Jeffords from Vermont was Republican and switched yeah. to Democrat in May. So one third isn't that quite accurate, but it's Republican. good enough for government work. Yeah. Hey, I'm talking to a former CBO person here. Um, and then divided government, almost 30 years. Almost 30 years. By the way, and I just, I couldn't, I had to get, this is, ap this is well, I was curious then when I looked at this chart, I said, wow, well the prior era was the New Deal era. Oh, sure. Starting with, FDR in 1933 through 1980, so about 48 years as opposed to 40 years. Of course, we don't know when the current era is gonna end or not. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, so how, of those years, how many years did Democrats control all three, Republicans control all three, and divide a government? So I had to get an answer for you. Here it is. Democrats control of 48 years, Democrats controlled all three for 30 years, 15 terms. Republicans, two years, 53, 54, under Dwight Eisenhower, divided government 18 years. So you can see sort of, you know, looking back between these two, wow, what a difference uh, era makes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but so what we, can, what we can see from this is that, and, and going back here, um, the effort to go all the way I would say the, the effort to do a single payer Medicare for all type thing 
really is incomprehensible unless Democrats controlled the White House, the Senate, and the House. In this era, I can't imagine a single Republican member of Congress voting for a Medicare for all piece. Could you? Well, not, 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 not modern Republicans. Not, not today. No, in yeah, this not era, today. where we are yeah, today. Yeah. Yeah. Back, back, in in the the old, back in the good old days, uh, they... It was conceivable. It was conceivable, it was conceivable but, but even less so today. So you're looking at sort of as a precondition for Medicare for all that you're going to have to have all three. And you're going to have to have, in particular, the Senate. Well, you need both. They're essential. But the Senate is really key because in the Senate to do something like this, you don't just need a bare majority. You need 60 votes to be able to overcome a filibuster. And Honestly, even today, Democrats have 46 seats in the US Senate. Not every one of those 46 would vote for Medicare for all today. We've heard that repeatedly. So really, you're looking at, if you wanted to do it, you'd need more than 60 Democrats. You'd probably need something like what LBJ had in 1965, when he had 68 Democrats in the US Senate, right? So anyway, so OK. I don't know how I got there. OK. So let's, let's look at where we are right now in terms of the US Senate and 2021. And you've got two easy sources. You can check this yourself. It's not, I didn't create this. This is you know, one of those things that you do when you copy from the web. This is Larry Sabato's crystal ball, University of Virginia. A very, I think, totally yeah. straight down the line, not ideological, not tilting to either side. Similar to the Cook political report. Little differences here and there. But this is what you can see. If you want to look at the prospects for 2021 right now, you can look at this. This is as of early October. He hasn't updated it since then, but I'm sure he will soon. So Democrats safe, likely lean. They probably can count on 46 seats which is one less than they have right now. And Republicans can probably count on 51 seats with three toss-ups. So on a good day, on a good day a year from now, or 11 months from now, um, Democrats' best prospect is 49. Maybe if it's a wave 50, 51, 52. But in terms of getting up to the kind of levels that you would need to be able to engineer Medicare for all, not even close, not a prayer. So the question is kind of with all this, I just can't help notice because I watch all the Democratic debates and everyone except the last one, the first 45 minutes, they spend arguing with each other about Medicare for all. And I just keep scratching. I say, what are they arguing about? This, doesn't, this is going nowhere. This isn't going to happen. Um, and so that's kind of my, that's, I'll stop there. Can, but, I, can um, I just then yeah. interrupt and maybe ask both yeah. why? Why what? Why, if we're all so pessimistic about Medicare for All and you have all the data to sort of highlight why, why are they spending so much time talking about Medicare for All? Well, I think, you know, you've got, you've got two candidates who are really out there for it, Eliz uh, uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, although she's stepped back since the catastrophic so episode of the financing plan that she put forward. And so now she's saying, well, third year and something like that. Usually your third year, you lose seats in the midterm elections, not you don't end up with more strength going forward. Now, of course, that's all just looking to the past. Maybe there's a glorious future that's totally different than what we've seen over most of the past 70 years. But I just, I just don't see it. So at the same end, so, so this is probably, I hope this isn't bumming some of you out too much. But I think that there's actually something important here and there's something positive. And I saw this because I worked in the Senate in 2008, 9, and 10 on the writing and passage of the ACA. I was a state rep in the early 90s and watched the Clinton plan very closely. One of the things you can't help but observe is when big comprehensive health reform is on the agenda, even if it's less than comprehensive like Clinton, it tends to suck up all the political oxygen in the room. And people have no time or space to talk about pretty much anything else. And it is possible <coughs> to throw all the dice, to throw all your political capital into the ring and end up with nothing like the three times 
that I showed you up here and actually accomplish nothing at the end of the day. And at the same time understanding that it is possible, it is possible using the budget reconciliation process to fix a lot of the principal pain points that people are experiencing right now with the design and structure of the Affordable Care Act. It is possible to significantly change the subsidy structure and make it more realistic <coughs> so that we'll actually be a realistic subsidization based on household income. It is possible to go in and fix a lot of the cost sharing problems. There's a lot of things that can be done with 51 votes that doesn't involve burning down the house and thus leaves political capital on the table to use for other things that we also care deeply about like immigration reform, climate change, voting rights, tax equity, host of different things that are so terribly important that I care about just as much as I care about fixing our health care system. So those are some of my perspectives. So obviously I'm sitting, uh, from my perspective, to the right of John. Um, the, uh, actually, I think there's a more plausible explanation for a while of this talk, and it is uh, the curse of primaries. Who votes in a primary? It's not the average voter. Uh, it's the average, uh, in this case, Democrat, uh, who uh, is really steamed up and doesn't apparently have anything else to do with their lives. These are also people who watch cable news all the time. Uh, this would also apply to Republicans if, if we had a similar situation. So this is not a dig on re Democrats or Republicans. This is, I think this is just a, a, a product of uh, a system that may have worked at one time, but I don't think it works anymore. Um, anyway, I agree with John. You know, this, this is not something that's going to happen very soon. I would uh, suggest an addendum, uh, <clears throat> an extremely telling addendum to your, I think it was first or second slide. Go to the first one and see if that's it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's the one. What, what John conveniently forgot is that there was another movement towards expanding health insurance coverage. It might have been considered somewhat accidental. It started in the 40s uh, when uh, uh, the IRS, and I don't really understand exactly what happened, but basically uh, during wartime, uh, in order to keep uh, workers on the job, um, uh, big aircraft companies, for example, um, provided healthcare services and also bought What's that? They froze wages. And they froze wages, right, and they also bought, right, exactly. Compete. Right, well, they weren't exactly competing, um, but, but, it was, but, but they needed to retain their workers, and so they were offering health insurance coverage. Now, it wasn't anything like the coverage we have. Uh, it was Blue Cross, though, or maybe it was Kaiser in California. It was probably Kaiser in California. But anyway, so that's where this starts, and the reason that's a telling uh, omission is that was an expansion of uh, public support for private coverage. John was only talking about an expansion of uh, uh, taxpayer support for government coverage. And uh, we, would, we don't want to forget that, that, that private mean, coverage is actually very important. Was that Nixon's plan, though? Nixon. Which? Oh, I, actually, I don't know. 97. I think he was mostly, he, he, I was, I was, he was too, using he, an employer mandate. I was too young to know then. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was an employer mandate. Yeah, exactly. Um, but far more generous <clears throat> Uh, but but I but I I think I think the tax treatment is actually a, a more significant, mm -hmm. certainly than a number of these things that failed, mm -hmm. because it's it has has shaped the uh, political debate about uh, health insurance, uh, certainly in the modern era. But but I I think it basically shaped it. Um, in, in very strong ways from the 50s on. Uh, remember, it wasn't just the tax treatment. It was also the, the strength of unions in the 50s that actually created uh, generalized employer-sponsored coverage. Uh, the fall off of unionization may have contributed to some loss there, but, but I would say it was unions and, and, and tax treatment, and it was indeed uh, what are we going to do to, uh, in this case, it not necessarily attract em employees in the 50s. It was more attract people to our union. Um, and, and that became even more important in the 70s uh, and in the 80s when uh, there wasn't that much upward room on wages. Uh, that ability to influence wages 
I th diminished, uh, certainly in the 80s and largely gone in the 90s. So what else could you bargain over? And also, you couldn't, couldn't bargain over, over pension plans because that largely, uh, that, that business also went away from the unions. I think they were relieved about that. Uh, uh, we shifted to uh, uh, you know, IRAs and things like that. Um, so what was left? Health coverage. Um, and that really did shape democratic politics and strongly shaped it this time. There's uh, Elizabeth Warren. I, I feel sorry for her for actually trying to explain something to people. Well, this, this demonstrates that uh, um, uh, single payer sounds good the less you know about it. The more you know about it, it's not so good. But she also uh, I had to give some sort of a break, I don't remember exactly what it was, doesn't matter, it's not gonna happen, uh, to acknowledge that union plans are very important uh, because unions are very important to democratic politics. Um, I, I'm gonna raise the question of whether this is really relevant at all or not. Uh, universal coverage, uh, you know, one of the things, uh, maybe this is, you know, this is probably just a code, code term because that isn't what we really want. And, and I think uh, folks on the left and folks on the right for that matter, uh, uh, oftentimes will look at Europe and they'll say, well, gee, there are those, all those other countries, uh, not, not everybody recognizes what John said, which is there, actually every country is completely different in many, many ways, uh, including the way they handle their health insurance. But, but uh, in particular, uh, people say, well, Lower cost than the U.S., uh, we think better results. I think this is something of a statistical and uh, logical um, mistake. Uh, and, um, uh, and everybody's covered. So, gee, why don't we just adopt, and the people who don't study it say, why don't we adopt that? Whatever the heck that is, they don't know. Um, and uh, the fact is, though, it's, it's a lot more complicated, and, and it does not reflect our history, and if you don't start from where we are, then you're not going to get to where you think you're going to go. So in particular, when did most of those European systems come about? Well, they came about largely in the wake of World War II. Uh, <clears throat> so all of, those, all of the European countries were in serious economic trouble. I'm sure that uh, those national health systems, however they developed, largely came about because politicians in those countries said, well, we have to look like we're doing something because we can't make the economy grow. We can't just say, we'll pass a law and the economy will grow. Eventually, the economies all did grow. But there was political crisis there, and they reacted in a way that was not uh, you know, not unreasonable under those circumstances. So, but they were starting from a very low level of expenditure. Where are we today? We're at a very high level of expenditure. It's a lot easier to start low and then, uh, however you want to do it, keep the pressure on so that spending, although it rises in all European countries, it doesn't rise up to our level, as opposed to starting, let's say, next year, uh, or two years from now, and say, oh, well, you know, we're up to 18 or 90 percent of GDP. Let's see how we can get this down to 12. You're not going to see it. It's very hard to take it down once it's up there. And the reason is not because the government isn't allowed to negotiate. It's because people's expectations in the health sector and in general are different from expectations in other countries, Canada, I think, being a particularly apt example because they are a lot like us. They sort of speak English, but you know, um, uh, uh, we have a lot in common. But they started low and they stayed and they stayed low, and we did what we do. Uh, you know, that's why we buy thousand-dollar iPhones, and they probably buy flip phones, as I'm guessing. Um, uh, I'm a flip phone fan my fan, myself. Yeah, so. I have an N of one over here. <laughs> no, 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 well, my wife actually just converted to an iPhone, but uh, yeah, she's had a flip phone for years. Um, so, so it, uh, you know, why isn't this? Why wouldn't this work? And then, what could we? What could we do to not expand coverage, but do what we really want to do? What do we really want to do? We want everybody, and I'm going to put a little asterisk at everybody. We want everybody to have health insurance, but we want 
more importantly, we want everybody to have access to appropriate and efficient health care. Just because you have a health insurance card doesn't give you that. Um, uh, uh, and we would also like it to be something that we'd be willing to pay for. Those, those, those are basically, that's what we want. We want high quality care. We want it available to people who need it. We want to be able to afford it. Uh, and uh, we use health insurance to, you know, as the admission ticket. Uh, 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 but that may be the smaller part of it, really. Um, so, um, you know, if we move to a single payer system or we move to some sort of a, 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 a government buy-in, some sort of a government plan, uh, the, the, the number of options are, are it's too numerous to mention. It really doesn't matter. They all have the same basic characteristic, which is that if you're going to have a government option or a public option, uh, to be uh, attractive, uh, because uh, it's not single payer, it's not we're making everybody to, to join, uh, but to be attractive to people, to get them to sign on, especially those who uh, aren't insured or who aren't happy with their, with their coverage, then, then it has to be competitive against what is currently available. Let's ignore Medicare for the moment. Uh, what that means is that it has to be uh, cheaper than the kind of coverage that might be available on the exchanges. Uh, it, the benefits have to be possibly a little bit more generous. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about the deductibles, for example. It'd be nice to have a, a deductible that wasn't thousands of dollars if you're low income. Uh, and the, the uh, uh, panel of providers has to be wide enough so that people would say, yeah, that's a good plan. I can actually go see a doctor. Maybe not the, I can keep my doctor. That's a lie. But I can see a doctor. I don't have to, or I can go to a hospital that isn't in the next town you know, 200 miles away. Um, uh, so how do you accomplish that? Well, uh, the Medicare X plan uh, by uh, Senator, Senator right, Bennett, uh, 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 someone who will also not be running for president in uh, another year, uh, but he, he laid out in legislative language exactly how you would do it, and he's basically right. If you're going to get a plan like that to work, a, a government option to work, then uh, you're going to have to uh, pay healthcare providers less than commercial rates, and you're going to have to find some way to get healthcare providers to accept that payment rate, to accept your patients. And how you would do that uh, is, I think, he, his proposal is the way you would do it, which is uh, to say that if you're a doctor or a hospital or other kind of provider and you see any Medicare or Medicaid patients, you have to take uh, these uh, government option uh, patients as well. Uh, that wouldn't be very popular with the, with, the, with the medical sector, and they're a pretty powerful uh, bunch of lobbyists. Uh, but uh, that isn't where it stops. And unfortunately, that, that isn't going to give you the result that we all want. Uh, so uh, it doesn't stop there. It, it, it does not remain a government option because the competing plans on the exchanges, I'm using that as an example, won't be able to compete. Uh, they, but they won't be able to compete not because they're not potentially being very careful and selecting efficient providers, being very careful about promoting uh, appropriate care, being careful about avoiding fraud or overuse. Um, uh, no, that's not, that's not it. It's basically that they don't have the power to tell a doctor or hospital, you have to take a lower rate um, uh, or something bad will happen to you. Uh, in the private sector, uh, they don't have the authority to say, just do it. Whereas uh, with the government option, essentially to make it work, the government's putting, putting its thumb on the scale. And the way to think about that is, it's in essence a tax on the health sector, not that I think that the health sector shouldn't be taxed, but it is in essence a tax on the health sector transferred to this government plan. Um, it's a great way to do it in Washington because it doesn't look like a tax. It looks like you did something. Gov uh, the uh, politicians can take credit for it, but it does 
unravel the pr private insurance system, which I think a lot of Democrats wouldn't like. Well, they'd like to see some other solution, I think, other than that. Now, the other issue is, if you move to that kind of a system, and you have the government uh, regulating rates, regulating payment rates, will you be guaranteed to save money? That's the next question. And that, unfortunately, I have to say, is highly unlikely. And the reason, of course, thank God, is politics. Uh, the, the, uh, we have some history here in this country about the inability of Congress to stick to its guns on uh, uh, controlling Medicare payment rates. Uh, the sustainable growth rate you may, may have heard of, uh, this was a formula that was supposed to lower uh, uh, the update factor, the inflation factor that Medicare builds into its payment rates for physicians. And uh, uh, the first year that there was supposed to be a lowering, it actually happened. It was about a 4.2%, I think, reduction uh, in, in payments. Uh, that was really pretty remarkable. Um, but after that, for I think about 15 years, uh, uh, Congress repeatedly s said, no, we're not going to do that. They put it off. And then eventually they repealed the law altogether because they were looking at a potentially a 22 or 23% cut in physician payments in Medicare. And, and why didn't they stick to their guns? Well, actually, why didn't they stick to their guns all along? When it would have, you would have built up, you wouldn't have had a 20% reduction after 10 or 15 years. The answer is that they were afraid of senior citizens who vote. It wasn't just the, the, the AMA. It was really the senior citizens who vote, who have the power through uh, their agents who they don't even know are their agents. And so, and so would you actually save money with government negotiation of prices? In the short term, yes. In the long term, I doubt it. But if it was successful, you would build in some inefficiencies because as the Medicare program has proven, it, it is incapable of adjusting on a dime to changes in medical technology or changes in economic conditions or changes in much of anything. It's a, because it's a political process, it's not driven that way. It doesn't turn itself around even when there's a problem. And so that's what you get either immediately if it was single payer or over the, over the longer term if it's, if it's a, if it's a buy-in type of a program with the government controlling, controlling the prices. You could do something about this. There are lots of things you could do. Uh, uh, I'm not saying the government would get out of this. Uh, when, when you mentioned, uh, I thought I, sort of somewhat humorously, that the government would get out of the healthcare business but continue to subsidize insurance. Now, the government uh, is, stays, stays, yeah, 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 the government stays <laughs> in it. And but by the way, the government means us. And, and that's appropriate. That's redistribution, that's fine. One should ask, is it better to redistribute through the health system or through some other means that actually addresses the panoply of challenges faced by low-income people? It's not just health care. Anyway, I've probably used up all our time. Thank you. So we're going to open it up to questions in a minute. But, so let me start by saying I completely agree with you that it was probably easier after World War II when health care was a lower percentage of GDP to implement these universal health care systems. But given that we are starting at such a high set point for GDP, can you explain a little bit more why you think that we, there aren't things that we can do that can get us closer to universal coverage or there that could, in fact, bend the cost curve? Because there are certainly many oh, yeah. efficiencies associated with the fact that, as you described, they didn't show up on this map here mainly because they weren't really thought out through the political process, they were decisions for the IRS on a tax issue or the fact that we froze wages and it created this other, you know. Right, right, system. right. So, so uh, let, let me stick to the cost version of that question because I think that's really the way to think about it. And the answer is there are dozens of ways to start dealing with this issue and you should start dealing with it in terms of the Medicare program. The Medicare program is the biggest health insurer in the country, um, unless you believe that uh, you can add up all the states' Medicaid programs and say that they're all kind of the same, but they're not really. Uh, but but, but uh, Medicare is a big government-run program, kind of, not really government-run. 
Uh, and uh, there are lots of structural problems with that program that drive up costs for Medicare and then drive up costs for the rest of the system. So I'll give one example that is particularly relevant to today, and this has to do with prescription drug costs. Uh, you know, we, we uh, instituted the Medicare Part D program, came, on, came online in 1995, and within two or three years, uh, what we saw was uh, uh, a change in the way the drug industry priced its products. List prices started soaring. And uh, uh, what that, what the reason that happened was that the Medicare program suddenly was bringing online, uh, I don't know how many, tens of millions of people onto a benefit where the subsidy, uh, a large part of the subsidy was driven by people needing to use uh, a uh, high volume of expensive drugs, uh, having high, high drug costs. Uh, and I, let me not explain all of the mess that's involved, but there's a structural problem in the way the subsidies work in Part D. Uh, the uh, Medicare Payment Advisory Commission for years has been talking about it. A lot of other people on the left and the right have been talking about this for years. It's high time, it'd be great if they would do this next year or the year later, uh, to take advice from the Advisory Commission to Congress and change that structure so that uh, there will be uh, essentially almost no incentive to raise list prices. If you don't raise list prices, uh, if you go back to kind of normal discounting at, at the front end rather than the back end, then two things happen. One is that it reduces Medicare costs, but it also filters through to everybody else. Because uh, if you're buying uh, drugs, you have uh, deductible and, and uh, coinsurance on a private plan, that is tied to list prices. List prices have shot through the roof over the last 10 years. That's because of Medicare. If we change Medicare, we'll see downward pressure. I'm an economist, so I apologize for that. Uh, a couple of questions. First of all, the Affordable Care Act does not cover the elderly, by which I'm defining as over 65. I mean, some people will disagree that it's elderly, but <laughs> will, will the, is there any possibility that elders will be included when in, in the health care? Because right now they're not. And Medicare A is not free, and B does not cover everybody over 65. Question two, if we get rid of Trump, Trump is very divisive. And there's a lot of Republicans. I mean, you look at your chart, and Clinton, too, it was a Republican Congress. If we get rid of Trump, can, will we get reasonable Republicans? Question three, does the medical profession have an oligopoly? And maybe antitrust should say, you want a license, we're going to tell you what you can charge. So just going for number one, okay. <laughs> um, so there are elements of the Affordable Care Act that do address Medicare. Um, so in particular, within uh, Title III of the ACA, there was over this past decade the shrinking of the Medicare donut hole in uh, Medicare Part D. Uh, there was the addition of a lot of preventive and other kinds of benefits. But yeah, people in Medicare, um, for the most part, have a structure of care. Um, they buy supplemental coverage for things that are not allowed, or they go into Medicare Part C and they get a private insurer that manages all their care. But so I think it's not quite accurate to say that Medicare was not addressed at all in no, the ACA. No, I'm not saying Medicare. I'm saying people over 65. If you read the Affordable Care Act, it doesn't cover people over 65. Because they're in Medicare. Well, they're not all in Medicare. Not all people. No, but overwhelmingly they are. But not all people over 65 are in Medicare, mm -hmm. and Medicare doesn't cover everything. But the Affordable Care Act does not cover people over 65. Well, it does to the um, extent that it makes changes to Medicare, but I don't well, think well, well, actually, it, 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 yes. it, 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 the essential health benefits applies to virtually all private insurance today. Um, I have to say essentially because I'm not 100 percent certain. There's a, yeah, there's some grandfathered plans. So, so in in that regard. Uh, if you're over 65 and you're not in Medicare, then you have certain kinds of protections like that. Uh, but um, I, think, I think what you're maybe driving at is your perception, which I'm not sure I share, that Medicare beneficiaries or people who are over 65 who 
have some other kind of insurance are getting a raw deal. And I'm not, I'm not sure about, about people over 65 who don't have Medicare because the way you don't have Medicare is that you didn't work 40 quarters or you're, or you, or you're not disabled. Yeah. And so that is, that's a very small number of people. I'm a little uncertain no, about what population you're- employee. Some people who are over 65 or- Oh, state employees, or, oh, state employees. Right, if you were a government, or if you were a married woman, but married for less than 10 years per husband. Uh, right. so, so there are exceptions. Yeah, there are exceptions. I mean, you're, you're raising some pretty detailed issues that could easily be resolved at relatively low cost. No question about that. We should move Let's on to- to the second part. Yeah, reasonable Republicans. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> when did we say that there were reasonable Republicans? Back in the early 80s, maybe? So that would be about 50 years ago? There were some left in the 90s. Maybe in the 90s. Okay, so 40 years ago. Yeah, it might take, 40, might, might take 30 or 40 years. Um, but, but more seriously, uh, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, I have to agree with you. He has dominated the Republican Party in a way that no one ever anticipated. Uh, uh, I anticipate that if he actually is elected again, that there is a chance that maybe Republicans will have will find a backbone in the last two years of, of his second term if he gets one, because there isn't much he can do to influence their political fates. Um, uh, there, there really are uh, reasonable people who who call themselves Republicans, uh, and they, some of them even get elected. Uh, but but the Republicans have the same uh, primary system, and so with all of the noise that we have on both sides, uh, the same thing's going on in the Republican Party. Uh, and so I don't see this resolving itself very quickly. So this may be a little bit of the preview of the talk that's gonna happen after lunch that's gonna be more focused on healthcare and the election, but were you surprised to see healthcare playing such a major policy role in the primaries and in all of the Democratic presidential hopefuls, considering that when you look at this fantastic chart, there's usually a fair amount of spacing between major pushes to do something with the healthcare system. So no, I'm not surprised. And, and I think there's something that uh, is, is, is dynamically important to understand about Medicare for All in the context of the campaign, which is that your know, Medicare for all comes down to a really simple calculation in the political realm. Are you for it or are you yeah. against it? And then there's those messy people in the middle like Medicare for all who want it and so forth. But it's a kind of a bimodal choice. And that makes it then really easy and convenient for the media to focus on it to say, which side are you on? And it creates a dividing line mm -hmm. that sets up then a conflict and an argument and a debate. And so I guess I'm not surprised. I'm a little bit surprised by how much the Medicare for All piece has dominated the conversation to such an extent and crowded out conversation. I mean, to me, the most important healthcare things we should talk about is why have we had declining life expectancy in the United States for the past three years? Why do we have this incredible obesity and overweight epidemic that is dragging down the healthcare system and, and society? Why do we have this epidemic of gun violence? I mean, there's so many population health indicators that are life and death importance that aren't getting even a brief mention in the context of this campaign that it seems to me are fundamentally important. So, I, so I'm a little surprised by how much it's dominated, but dynamically I think it's pretty clear why it happens because it's so, I mean, what are the positions of the candidates on climate change? Um, and is there, is there a, you know, they're all against it, they're all in favor of fighting it, they've all got these ideas. I can't remember a single one of them. So there's no such dividing line as neat, maybe, you know, free college tuition or something like that, but very little else. And so there's something dynamically about Medicare for All that has just taken this over in a way that, you know, it's, on the one hand, it's nice to see a robust conversation. On the other hand, it's almost a distraction in terms of the real choices that we will have in 2021, no matter what happens. I, I, also, I also think that I agree completely. I also think that uh, uh, that isn't where legislation could possibly be. I mean, there is a possibility. I mean, this is supposed to be the preview, so here's the little preview. Um, 
so uh, it's very likely that there will be uh, another continuing resolution until mm, maybe the end of, maybe as late as the end of April. That'll be it. So there's going to be maybe a, a month or two window when Congress could actually consider uh, legislation. And uh, I think the ripest issue there is surprise billing. I don't happen to agree with a lot of the jibber-jabber that's going around in Congress about how to resolve it, because I think they don't really understand what they're talking about. But nonetheless, this is something that has also captured the public imagination. And it's the kind of thing that people really identify with. And furthermore, um, members of both houses of both parties who are running for re-election would like to say they did something. And that's something, I mean, it's, you know, if they pass something, whatever it was on, on uh, uh, a surprise billing, that would give them all great campaign ads that they desperately need that would detract, distract the conversation away from this big picture, no picture kind of a problem that they all have. Phrase Medicare for all is a bit ambiguous. Uh, it's a question of uh, who constitutes the all. So you started out by referring to all citizens being covered. Yep. I think you might want to retreat from that based on what you said, not just have all US citizens covered, but then maybe you want to stay there. I'm not sure. The other question is whether uh, Medicare for all is meant to be the sole system which covers everyone and offers equal treatment to everyone as a matter of justice. Uh, those are two possible uh, varieties that you might want to explore a bit. I think when we, when we talk about beyond citizens, we're mostly talking about the immigrant community. And for the most part, these days, we're mostly talking about the undocumented immigrant community because the, document, the, the, the documented immigrant community actually was helped enormously under the ACA and actually does have right. actually a better set of benefits than the American citizenry because they can get coverage zero to 100 percent of poverty and citizens in the state, the 13 states that haven't adopted Medicaid expansion are out of luck. So, but, but I, I guess, you know, the, the, and, and one of the questions, and it's getting mixed up in the conversation is, are immigrants part of the national health conversation or, are they part, or is their health status part of the medical care insurance, part of the immigration debate. And I think that's a, that's a dynamic tension that's going on right now um, that, uh, that we've yet to see really play out. But I think it could become a very big issue in the, uh, in the national debate in the fall. Uh, could, could, could I, I, just a quick comment on that, I agree completely. Uh, the, th this issue also got messed up by Bernie Sanders because Bernie Sanders' bill uh, said everything's free. Every, not only is everything free, but the everything is much bigger than has ever been covered by insurance uh, in any country, including this one. Uh, and uh, you know, no premiums, no deductibles, no coinsurance, no none of that stuff. It's all going to be completely free, and it's going to be available to absolutely everybody. Well, the fact is that you can't afford that. And the fact is that no other country does it that way anyway. Uh, the everything free just doesn't work. And the you all come is a real problem. So, you know, uh, a little anecdote, my mother uh, uh, took a trip uh, when she was a little too old to be taking a trip to Europe. And she tripped on a, on a cobblestone, broke her arm. And she was in Italy. That's not a good place to break your arm. At least it wasn't 20 years ago. Uh, so they put this 50-pound uh, plaster cast on it. And of course, uh, they did have uh, the kind of light cast that uh, uh, somebody her age uh, could have handled. And, and then she was miserable for the rest of the week until she got home. Um, th th basically, don't break your arm in Italy. Uh, but if you do, you're going to pay for it. And that's perfectly reasonable. The, immig the immigration issue is separate from that, and we haven't resolved either the health side of it or the immigration side. Okay. So I'm just going to take the let. We have one like one minute left. So, okay, you mentioned surprise billing. So you you, ha you shook out the crystal ball. You showed us about the Senate. Let's take out our crystal balls again. 
Where are we in 2022? Have we accomplished anything? Drug pricing just goes away, nothing happens. Surprise billing you mentioned maybe happens. Where do you see us, us in 2022 in terms of progress towards at least getting closer to more universal coverage here in the United States? I think I, it's impossible to say without knowing what happens 11 months from now. Uh, there's, there, you can create scenarios where regardless of what happens, there's the possibility of something happening and it will be very different in terms of what is the constellation of control of the three power sources in DC. And absent that, you can make speculations and it's not worth putting any money on the table in terms of backing it up. I, I, think, we, I think we'd be more specific than that, John, uh, because anything big takes a lot of effort to put together. And so by 2022, maybe something big, however you want to define big, might have been taken up by Congress. Whether it passes or not is the question. But it's questionable to me, really, whether something really big would, would even get there by that time. Uh, partly because I think the ACA uh, took the, in essence, got the easy part of generalized health reform. Picking up a lot of people and throwing some money at it uh, isn't really the hard part. The hard part is uh, now that you've got them, don't you want to improve the healthcare system? That's really the hard part. Having said that, however, I think the small bore things definitely will happen. I think they'll, they're dying to do something in the, this coming spring. And then the following year, uh, no matter who's president, although I feel much more strongly in terms of a Democrat being president, they'll want to say they did something right away. They want to prove that there was a reason to be voted for. Now, in, in Trump's case, I don't know. But, but if it's a Democrat, I think some things that are smaller bore that are still important, I think will happen. It's, again, what is that big bore thing? I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. So again, if there's a Democrat in the White House and Republicans hold the Senate, then that substantially diminishes the possibility of what might happen. And right now, if you're betting money, you bet money that Republicans control the Senate. So it's very different. One thing that's not getting talked mm -hmm. about at all that you're gonna start hearing about a lot Texas. In, no, oh, no, in no. January 2021, is that by 2026, Medicare Part A reaches the Medicare fiscal cliff, yeah. and the hospital insurance yeah. trust fund starts running out of money. Oh, yeah. So it's gonna be up to the next president in that <laughs> term to address that over the course of then the following four years, and it's something that they have a terrible time doing, and it's going to, for if you want to stop something from happening, you say, you want to expand Medicare. Medicare is going broke in 2026. What are you going to do about that? And it's going to be very difficult, whatever party is in control of the White House, I think. Well, it, I just have to say, I really wish that were true. Uh, but the Medicare uh, trustees report has had zero political impact since, I think the first one was 1967. Zero. Uh, and uh, furthermore, in 1983, uh, we got prospective payment system because of the Medicare uh, hospital it, trust fund in 1983. That it was, was a the very biggest uh, change to Medicare ever. And then 1997 again. You know this 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 cliff really does matter. It seems to me if you look at it over the if you, history of the program. If, if you believe it, I think in 1983 it was because politics was different then. I think uh, if we're talking about 2021. Uh, we're not talking about people who can reach agreement very easily. Uh, and uh, I think they're also, even though most of them are still lawyers, most of them have finally gotten a little understanding about what those numbers from the trustees report mean. Speaking of people who can't reach agreement easily, please join me in <laughs> applauding this panel.